Hello and welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at the tragedy of Euripides called Iphigenia, translated out of Greek into English by, uh, by uh, Jane Lady Lumley. Uh, this is a uh, private translation uh, made probably in the 1550s, early 1550s, uh, I think latest is uh, uh, 53, 54-ish, um, are plausible dates. It's a, uh, a, a private manuscript uh, that was uh, not published until, uh, I assume, relatively modern times, uh, and uh, it is, uh, I say, of a Greek tragedy, uh, one of the, uh, I think, the earliest uh, uh, English translations of Greek tragedy, and also uh, one of our, uh, or at least our, uh, the earliest known uh, piece of uh, uh, dramatic writing uh, by a, a woman. And uh, I am uh, not your host today. I am normally your host, Robert Crichton, but today I am actually going to be mostly invisible as I go and try and uh, get deep into the text of trying to figure out the differences between the original and uh, and this translation and what interesting effects may or may not have come out of the translator Lady Lumley uh, uh, as opposed to what came out of the original Euripides. Running the room instead today will be uh, Liza Graham and I'm going to pass you over to Liza now. Yes, hello, I am Liza Graham, your guest host for today. Be afraid, be very afraid. Um, and uh, we have a very talented cast of readers for this tragedy of Iphigenia uh, by Jane Lady Lumley. Uh, reading, in fact, Iphigenia herself is... Hello, my name is Lynn. I uh, am a teacher in the United States. And reading the role of Agamemnon, Iphigenia's father, is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, based in Suffolk. And reading the role of Senex, servant to Agamemnon, will be... Will be Andrew? Um, yeah, cool. Uh, and uh, a Andrew, so do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Andrew Walton reed and I'm from Chelsea in Essex, and I'm an actor and I'm playing the role of Senex. Marvellous. Uh, and playing the role of Clytemnestra, Iphigenia's mother, Agamemnon's wife, is... Alexandra. Hello. Excellent. Uh, and reading the chorus will be... Uh, Lois, I live in London. Reading the role of Nuncius, the messenger, will be... Hello, I'm Francis Cox. I'm an actor based in Amsterdam. And reading the role of King Menelaus, Agamemnon's brother, will be... I am Steve Lang Longstaff in rainy Lancaster. Yes, it's rainy here in London too. And uh, as we've said, I will be your guest host for today. Uh, we... I... Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, and reading the role of Achilles, that heroic warrior who I totally forgot about, will be. <laughs> Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian, and it's also raining in Yorkshire. And everywhere is locked down, as as a Alexandra so so feelingly puts it. Um, so. Uh, if readers, if you would scroll down past the argument, which we're not going to read, uh, we start with um, a scene between Agamemnon and his elderly servant Senex. Here beginneth the tragedy of Euripides, called Iphigenia. Come hither, O thou old man. I come, but what is the matter, O king? Thou shalt know anon. I make haste to come, for my old age is very quick and ready for both the strength of my limbs and also the sight of my eyes doth yet continue. But what meaneth this? Methinks I see a star shoot. It may be so indeed, for it is not yet midnight, as it may be judged by the course of the seven stars. I think so too, for I hear no noise of birds, neither of the sea, nor yet of the wind. All things now are quiet and at rest. What is the cause, O king? That is the time of night thou comest abroad. For all they that be of this haven take their rest still. Yea, and the watchmen as yet not come from the walls. Wherefore I think it meet to go in. O oh, thou old man, thou seemst to me to be very happy. But truly, 
I do think that mortal man to be very fortunate, which being without honour, doth lead his life quietly. For I cannot judge their estate to be happy, which rule in honour. In these things of glory, I renown of man's life doth chiefly consist. But this renown is very brittle, for to wish for dignity, it seemeth very pleasant, but it vexeth them that obtain it, for sometimes the gods, not truly honoured, take vengeance of man's life, and other wiles against men's minds, with care and thought to bring their matters to pass, are wonderfully troubled. I do not praise his opinion in a noble man, for, O oh, Echinemon, thou was not born to have all things chance happily unto thee, for seeing thou art a mortal man, thou must sometime rejoice and sometimes again be sorry, for whether you will or no, it must needs happen, because it is so appointed by the gods. But methinks you are writing a letter by candlelight. What is this writing that you have in your hand so? which sometime you tear and then write again, others whilst you scale it, and anon unseal it again, laminating and weeping, for you seem to make such sorrow as you were out of your wit. What is the matter, O king? What is the matter? If you show it to me, you shall tell it to a trusty man and a faithful, for thou knowest me to be one that tenderest thy wife's father sent with her as part of her dowry, because he thought me to be a messenger and meet for such a spouse. Thou knowest that Leda, Thystes' daughter, had three daughters, Phoebes and Clytemnestra, whom I married, and Helena, whom many noble men desired to have to their, to their wives. But her father Tyndarus, considering what great destruction was threatened to them that obtained her, doubted long whether he should give her in marriage to any of them or no. Wherefore, because he desired to have all things to happen prosperously, he caused all the young men that desired to marry his daughter to come all together into the temple, and there to make a promise each to other before the gods, that if any man, either Grecian or else barbarian, would go about to take Helena from him, whom she chose to be her husband, that they then all would with cruel battle take vengeance of that man, and this being thus brought to pass, Tyndarus gave her free liberty to choose among them all, whom she liked best, and she chose Menelaus. But I would to God it had not happened, for within a while after, Paris, who, as the common voice saith, was judge between gods of their beauty, came to Lysodon, and being a godly young man, and of noble parentage, began to fall in love with her, and so, taking her privily away, brought her to a little village upon the hill Ida. But as soon as these news were brought to Menelaus, he being as one half out of his wit for anger, began to rehearse the covenant which he and divers other noble men had made betwixt them at the desire of Tyndarus, saying that it was meet that they should help him, seeing that he was oppressed with such a manifest injury. And the Grecians being wonderfully moved with his pitiful decreed that they would all win battle invade the Trojans, which so wrongfully had taken away Helen. Wherefore, after that, they had prepared weapons, horses, chariots, and all other things necessary for the battle. They chose me to be their captain, because I was Menelaus' brother. But I would that this honour had happened to some other in my place, for now we having gathered together our host, and prepared ourselves ready to battle, are constrained to tarry here, idle at this haven, because the winds being against us, we can sail no further. And Calchas, the prophesier, studying long what should be the cause of it and occasion, at length hath answered that if my daughter Iphigenia be slain and sacrificed to the goddess Diana, that then the whole host shall not only have three passage to toy, but also victoriously conquer it. But without the death of my daughter, none of all these things can be brought to pass. As soon as I heard of this, I commanded that the host should be sent home again. For I answered that my daughter should never be slain through my consent. 
and I using all manner of means to persuade my brother to the contrary, yet notwithstanding I was so moved with his earnest desire that at length, agreeing to his cruel request, wrote a letter to my wife that she should send my daughter hither, and because she should be the better willing to let her go, I feigned that she should be married to Achilles, because he was so desirous of her that he denied to go to battle without he might have her to his wife. So that now I have determined the death of my daughter under the colour of marriage, and none knoweth of this, saving only Menelaus, Calchas, and Ulysses. But now I, repenting me of the message which I wrote to my wife of, have here in this letter denied all that I said before, so that if you will carry this letter unto Greece, I will declare unto you all that is contained in it, because I know you to be a faithful servant, both to my wife and me. Senex, Andrew, it's your cue. Yeah, my page has just gone blank, so the signal's just completely gone and thrown the page out. Apologise. Um, shall I read the line? Yes, please. Show me, I pray you, what answer I shall make to your wife, agreeable to the letter. Tell her that she shall not need at this time to send my daughter hither, that her marriage shall be deferred unto another time. Will not Achilles think you be angry, for that under the colour of him you have determined the death of your daughter? Achilles beareth the name only, but he is not partaker of the thing. Neither knoweth he what craft we go about. Thou hast prepared grievous things, O king, for thou hast determined to sacrifice thy own child under the colour of marriage. Alas, I was then wonderfully deceived, for the which I am now marvellously troubled. Wherefore, I pray thee, make haste, and let not thine old age hinder thee in this journey. I sh make haste to go, O king. Do not stay by the pleasant springs, and tarry not under the shadowing trees, neither let any sleep hinder thee. Do not you think any such slothfulness in me, O king? I pray you mark well the way, and look about it diligently, lest that my wife preventing you happen to come hither with my daughter in the meantime. It shall be done even so. Make haste, I pray thee, and if thou meet my wife, turn her back again. But what shall I do, that your wife and your daughter may believe me? Deliver them this token, which is enclosed in this letter. Go quickly, for the day beginneth to appear. I pray thee, help me now in this matter, for there is no man to whom all things have chanced happily. So, um, the, uh, this what a, what a monologue and what a reading thank you alan for for making that so clear uh, it, somehow the king has to do his own exposition in this play uh how did that how did that feel to you alan <laughs> it, I, to quote uh, richard millhouse nixon expletives deleted um <laughs> god it was hard work and it, it, it doesn't flow that easily in, in terms of the, the punctuation is not particularly helpful for breathing. Um, and I, while I'd seen the length of it, I hadn't actually prepared it at all. So I was actually working pretty well cold on that. Well, that was very impressive for a cold read. Uh, for those listening, uh, you will have discerned that this play is prose, unlike unlike many of the other plays we have read here, which are uh, all or partly in verse. Uh, this play is entirely in prose. And um, 
and there is uh, l less punctuation in the text than a modern uh, edition would put in, which partly leaves things to the actor's discretion, but also can occasionally leave you flailing a bit. Uh, certainly trying to work out the direction of travel. <laughs> no, no, I, think, I think I managed to work out what the plot line was, but uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to pass an exam on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Uh, what Andrew? What did you make of Senex? He's a very interesting character. Yeah, um, trying to give his um, guidance, I think, over um, what the king should do, basically. Um, yeah, it's um, fatherly time, old fatherly time. I think type of person. I think he is. Um, so he has an interesting type of role. Yes. Yeah, I, I like the, um, the the difference with the prose because um, I think because we've, I've been used to reading quite recently um, the way that the um, old text is written in um, certain way, and then doing prose is completely different. So it's it's just. It's, it's nice to do something different and be challenged at the same time, I think, with the way that it's it comes out. So, yeah. Y yeah, a very different feel. So thoughts from the room uh, on, on that scene? Francis? Yeah, I, uh, in terms of Senex, I thought it was, it, the scene establishes the fact that uh, Akinemnon and Senex have this a very close relationship. Senex is obviously a very trusted advisor because he asked the king, what are those letters you're writing? Why do you keep tearing them up and rewriting them? So that establishes the fact that he's, in a sense, more than a servant. He's a very trusted advisor, which I thought was interesting. It was, it was one of the things that sprung out at me during the reading. Yes, because when you have a messenger in a drama like this, one of the questions is, is the messenger trustworthy? And in this case, uh, 100%, he, he, seems to, he seems to be. Uh, so any more thoughts before we carry on? Uh, yes, Lois. Yeah, it strikes me this is, in a way, what you expect of Euripides, that is that he takes an interest in this Senex character because uh, for the purposes of the play, it really doesn't matter who he is. He's just being told to take this message to Clytemnestra. But in fact, he's given a story. And uh, uh, I think that's quite interesting. I mean, the rest of it, the, the whole backstory that Agamemnon tells, presumably the audience would be expected to know this anyway. It's uh, terribly familiar. It, it is. Um, we don't know if there... I think this is the first Iphidonia play we have. I... There, there may be earlier ones that are lost, of course. A lot of Greek drama is lost to us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, this Euripides is the first Iphigenia play we have. This, this one. Uh, oh. uh, but, but so much of it is lost. Francis? Uh, yeah. Um, I also, one thing I also noticed was that um, uh, the, the playwright immediately sets up, sets up this, this great dilemma for Agam Agamemnon. Does he, you know, does he sacrifice his daughter or does he sacrifice his host? I mean, it's an impossible choice. So it, it kind of ups the stakes right from the get go. Yes, it's it's not it's not just his loyalty to his brother and his uh, his pledged oath. Uh, it's it's that he has an entire army waiting on what mm -hmm. he's going to do, and we will see uh, how that plays out. But let's get into the next scene. Um, where Senex is, uh, has accepted Agamemnon's letter to Clytemnestra saying, don't send Iphigenia, uh, and he has gone off with the letter and the token, but something dramatic happens. Chorus, what happens? What is this? Methinks I see Menelaus striving with Agamemnon's servant. I keep getting um, dropouts of my um, screen going every so often. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, if Helen, if you can read in for now, Andrew, when you get when you get it back and get your place, raise your hand so Helen can see it and give it over okay. to you. Is that cool? Okay. All right. Yep. 
Yeah, uh, okay, I'm just moving my script so that I can also see Andrew. Yes. Uh, Darest thou, O Menelaus, commit so grievous an offence in taking away those letters, which is neither meet nor lawful that thou should see? Go thy way. Thou art faithful to thy master. Truly you have objected to me a good reproach. Thou hast deserved punishment. It is not meet that thou shouldest open these letters which I carry. But neither oughtest thou to bring such a mischief upon all Greece. Thou strivest in vain, Melanaeus, for I will not deliver my letters to thee. Thou shalt not pass with them. And I will not leave them behind me. If thou wilt not deliver them to me, I will break thy head with my mace. I will not pass for, I pass not for that, for I think it's a good thing to die for my master's cause. Oh, thou froward fellow, deliver me thy letters and make no more business here. Help, O Agamemnon, I suffer injury of Melanaeus, for with strong hand he hath taken away your letter, and he passes not of honesty <coughs> nor yet of night. Right. How? What business and contention is there amongst you? I ought rather to tell the matter than you, Melanaeus. What have you to do, Menelaus, with my servant? Or what cause have you to strive with him, and to take away that which pertaineth to me? And toward me, I pray you, that I may tell you all the matter. Think you that I, the son of Atreus, I'm afraid to look upon the man, Menelaus. Seest thou, O Agamemnon, these thy letters, which contain thy crafty counsel? I see them very well, but thou shalt not keep them no, long. I will not deliver them to thee, before I have showed them unto the whole host. Wilt thou desire to know that which doth not become thee? And darest thou open the seals of my as letters? As soon as I had opened thy letter, I marvelled what mischief had put those things in thy mind, which thou hast privily declared in this letter. Where did thou get my I letter? Took them from your servant. For I, watching by the host, to hear of your daughter's coming, by chance met with him. Do you think it meet? that you should know of my matters, I pray you? Is this not a token of a naughty and unshamefast man? It was my pleasure so to do, for I owe no duty to thee. Think you that I can suffer this so grievous a thing, that I should neither do my business, nor yet rule mine own house after my fancy? <laughs> Surely you change your mind, oftentimes. Sometimes you think one thing, by and by again you're in another mind. Indeed, you file your words well, but a learned tongue disposed to evil is a naughty thing. Yea, and an unconstant and a diverse mind is as evil. For now I will overcome you with your own words, if you will not deny them for anger. For I will not speak them greatly your praise. Do you not remember that when you desired to be made captain over the Grecians, you seemed to refuse it, though indeed you wished for it? How lowly then did you show yourself, taking every man by the hand and keeping open household and saluting every man after his degree, as though you would have bought your honour with the goodwill of the people. As soon as you had obtained this honour, you began to change your conditions. For you refused the friendship of them which had showed themselves friendly to you before. And then you waxed proud, keeping yourself secretly within your house. It does not become a good man to change his fashions after that he is in honour. He ought then to be more faithful to his friends when that he is in place to do them pleasure. Of 
objected this reproach unto you, because I myself have had proof of it. After that, you, with the whole host, were come to this haven. You were careless when you could have no passage over the sea, and the Grecians desiring license to go home, refusing to spend their time idly here, then you, being wonderfully troubled, fearing lest an evil report should rise of you, because you being captain over a thousand ships should not overcome Troy, you ask counsel of me what you have to do, that you are neither lose dignity nor yet dishonour your name. Wherefore, as soon as Calchas the prophesier had answered that the Grecians should both pass the sea quietly and also conquer Troy if your daughter were sacrificed to the goddess Diana, then you were very glad, promised of your own accord, to give your daughter to be sacrificed. Being not compelled by any power, you sent unto your wife for your daughter, feigning that she should be married to Achilles. But now, suddenly you've changed your mind. I've written other letters saying that you will not agree to the death of your own child. Take heed that you do not deny this. The heavens itself can bear witness of your sayings. Truly, this same doth happen to diverse other men, which in the beginning, when they take any weighty matter in hand, do labour very, very diligently till they've obtained it, and they leave it off shamefully, which shame doth chance sometimes through the fearfulness of the subjects, and sometimes when they do rule the commonwealth, which are unmeet for it. For now I do chiefly lament the state of the unfortunate Grecians, which when they took in hand a noble enterprise against barbarians, are constrained through your occasion and your daughters with great dishonour to leave the same. Wherefore, truly, I think that no captain ought to be chosen for dignity, nor yet for favour, rather for wit. That he that should rule a host ought in wisdom to excel all other. Surely it is a grievous thing that one should fall out with another, especially that any contention should be among brethren. Oh, I will tell you of your faults, Menelaus, but in few words, lest I should seem to be unshamefast. Wherefore, I will speak to you as it becometh one brother to another. Tell me, I pray you, why do you sigh so? Who hath done you any injury? Do you lament the taking away of your wife? But we cannot promise you to get her again for you you yourself have been the occasion of your own trouble. Wherefore, seeing I have not offended you, there is no cause that I should suffer punishment for that which I am not guilty of. Doth my preferment trouble you, or else does the desire of your beautiful wife vex you? For evil men diverse times have such like desires, and although truly I am to blame, for that I have not determined any my matters, yet I fear me, lest you are much more to be reprehended, for that you, being delivered of an evil wife, cannot be contented. These sayings truly do not agree with that which was spoken before. Yet, notwithstanding, they do teach us well that we ought not willingly to hurt our children. Alas, my wretch have never a friend. Yes, you have diverse friends, except you will neglect them. But it doth become friends to lament one with another. You would have friends, you are best to love them whom you desire to help, and not them whom you would hurt. Why, do you not think that Greece needeth help in this matter? Yes. But I think that both you and Greece also are bewitched of some god. Brother, methinks you are too proud of honour. Wherefore, I must seek some other way and get me other friends. O oh, Agamemnon, thou valiant captain, I have brought to thee... Um, sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, I, and and well begun, Nuncius. Um, we we will we will hear you anon. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about that scene before we go on. Uh, 
and here we have the two kings of the Achaeans having having this uh, this mighty argument. Uh, how how did that feel, Stephen? Uh, it, it's re really difficult to get your head around the mindset, isn't it? Of kind of heroic Greece, you know, sort of Menelaus is, mostly seems to be concerned with sort of decorum, you know. It, 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 there's a sort of unspoken gender agenda going on here, isn't there? Sort of a changeable, you know, what? and uh, he's, he's disrespecting the other nobles, you know. It's kind of like, I, I was reading that out because well, I was cold reading as well. I was reading it and thinking, yeah, and we're going to get on to this kind of killing your kid stuff. And it's kind of, uh, soon we'll get on to that, won't we? You know, so it seems to be sort of, something of great weight sort of whizzing past the point of high velocity, which makes it uh, really difficult to do on a cold read, you know. So strangely, the Menelaus speech, strangely unfocused for me. Yeah, Helen? Um, I was firmly of the opinion before we started reading that this thing was not a play I mean, it was translated not to be acted and that it was, in fact, unplayable as it stood. I'm changing my mind because the people are really <laughs> doing something with it. Um, far, far more than I thought from reading it. I thought it was impossible. Yeah, Alex? Um, yes, I agree that there's something, oh, sorry, um, that there's something very playable in this. And it feels strange because, especially with the, with the big long speeches, um, we are so unaccustomed to that being how people express themselves because writing has since become much more naturalistic. Um, but in terms of what people are talking about and how they are phrasing their, their opinions and their concerns, it isn't as flat as it might seem. So I was reading the Menelaus um, sort of navigating of, of uh, subjects um, as he's addressing what matters to him in that arrangement and what matters to him is not the value of a child within the family that's that's other stuff it's about dignity and honor and the family name um and so that was an interesting contrast to what agamemnon was valuing or was reconsidering and yeah i'm i'm actually really enjoying this yeah lois uh, lynn i mean sorry one of the l ladies <laughs> Yeah, uh, the the it this as as much as this is maybe not our idea of what drama looks like, there does really seem to be a, a character contrast being set up between Menelaus, who is very, he's sort of he's he's laser focused. He has we have a job to do. This is how it is, and, and we're going to get it done, whatever stands in our way. And to him, the the greatest fault a man can have is being flexible is being able to change your mind is having conflicting feelings and agamemnon on the other hand is a, a more ambivalent and ambiguous character he he knows what honor compels him to do but he um but he uh, you know has a number of conflicting values going on in his life he doesn't want to kill his own kid uh he wants to be leader of the band but he kind of doesn't so in a way Menelaus seems a little less human and Memnon seems a little bit more like a sort of complicated conflicted character but the uh, the contrast does seem deliberate yes um, Lo Lois um, I also uh, say what you were gonna say and then I have a question for you Okay. Um, yeah, well, the chorus is lying. These sayings do not agree with what was said before or something is certainly true. I mean, we're given, you know, Agamemnon's account of things. They chose me as their leader because I was Menelaus's brother. Then we get Menelaus's account. You were dying to be leader. You groveled to everybody. You know, you were practically buying votes. I mean, it's a, and you don't really know which of them is telling the truth. Uh, that struck me as interesting. I, I think this choral scene became i mean I, I i didn't remember it until we we did it but i think that people referred to it later on as pretty much the prototype of all the great quarrel scenes uh in drama you know and there are a lot of famous ones that i won't go into now but uh, uh you know the the realization that that is where you get real dramatic tension 
Yeah. So I have a question for you uh, about the chorus. Um, uh, who who are the chorus, and uh, what do you see as as their function? Well, yes. I, when I was told I was going to be the chorus, I was all excited. Oh, great! Wonderful speeches. Then I realized that uh, I remember I, I've never done Greek, but I remember when I was thinking of doing it, someone told me that. Uh, it's relatively easy to read Greek drama except for the choruses. These are the really poetic bits where the language gets difficult. And that's obviously what Jane Lumley decided because she decided not to translate them. So the chorus, as far as I can see, and this is one person, and uh, I don't think she, I don't know if she even knew about how the chorus was used. I mean, that it was the song and dance troupe, and this was the thing that cost the, the money that you had to be given a chorus in order to put on a Greek tragedy that the audience was all waiting excitedly to see what the chorus was going to look like this time. I don't think any of that uh, would have been in her uh, her sphere of knowledge. And she just thought, oh, look at these long speeches, cut, cut, cut. Well, as you say, they're some of the more challenging passages, I'm sure, for a translator as well as for an actor. Um, it makes the drama move faster, but it takes away that poetry that you associate, that the observation, the reflection that you associate with a, a Greek chorus. Um, I'd like to carry on. Stephen, you had something, I believe. It's not that important. It's okay. Carry on. Well, keep it for, keep it, uh, do, do keep it, because I do want to hear it for the, for the next break. Mm -hmm. And um, here, here we, uh, so, so we have, um, we have two brothers. The argument isn't really resolved, but now here comes a messenger, Nuncius. O oh, Agamemnon, thou valiant captain, I have brought to thee Iphigenia, thy daughter, whom thou didst send for, and with her is come Clytemnestra, thy wife, and Orestes, that thou mightest be comforted with the sight of them. I have made haste to bring you this news, because I see all the Grecians waiting for the coming of your daughter, as it were for some strange thing. And some, some of them say that you have sent for her by cause you are desirous to see her. Other judge that she should be married, and some thinketh that she should be sacrificed to the goddess Diana. Tell me, O king, I pray thee, to whom shall she be married? But now let us leave to speak of such things, for it is need and time to prepare that which, that which shall be necessary for the wedding. Wherefore, I pray you, Menelaus, also be merry, for this day, as I trust, shall be very fortunate to you, Iphigenia. Thou hast said well, wherefore go thou in, for all things will chance happily to thee. But what shall I say, which am thus in trouble, and yet may not bewail my own misery for this occasion? They which are of mean estate seem to me unto me very happy, for they may complain of their misery and bewail with tears the deaths of their children. But to noble men, no such thing is granted, for I dare not lament my unfortunate chance. And yet it grieveth me that I may not show my misery. Wherefore, I know not what I should say unto my wife, nor with what face I should look upon her. Alas, she hath done done me because of her coming, although indeed she thinketh she hath a good occasion. She believeth that her daughter shall be married, in which thing she shall find me a liar. Again, I have pity of the little girl, for I know she will speak thus unto me. O oh, father, will it kill me? If you forsake me, of whom shall I ask remedy? Alas, what answer shall I make to this? Surely nature ought to move me to pity, and if that would not, yet shame should let me. Alas, alas! What a great reproach is it, is it, the father to be an occasion of his own child's death? How therefore am I troubled on this part pity and shame, on the other side honour and glory doth much move me. We also lament your chance so much as it becometh women to lament the misery of princes. I pray you brother, let me see your hand. I give you liberty, for I will put all the victory in your hand. No, we'll not flatter you, brother, but I will show you faithfully my opinion. Surely when I saw you in such misery, I was moved with brotherly pity and lamented much your chance. Wherefore now I counsel you. 
not to slay your daughter. Neither do yourself any damage for my cause. It is not meet that through my occasion you should hinder either yourself or any of your children. Now weighing the matter, consider what a grievous thing it is to kill your own child. Besides this, I pity much her, because I do consider she is my kinswoman and hath not deserved to die for Helen's cause. Wherefore, I will counsel you not to sacrifice your daughter. Rather, send home again the whole host. As for my part, I will agree unto you. For I, considering how a father ought to love his child, have changed clean my opinion. I know a good man ought to follow that which is good. Oh, Menelaus, you have spoken like a noble man. I praise you, Menelaus, because you have changed your mind so gently. Surely ambition and desire of wealth hath caused much strife between brethren, albeit I do abhor such cruel brotherhood. Although you are agreed, yet I am compelled to slay my daughter. Nobody will compel you. Yes, truly, the whole host will require her of me. We send her home again. You need not deliver her to the Grecians. If I should deceive them here, then they would punish me when I come home. You ought not, truly, to fear so much the host. They know not of this matter. But I doubt, lest Calchas show them of it. You may remedy that in punishing him. Brother, do you not feel fear Ulysses? Yes, truly. Does lie in his power to hurt either you or me. I doubt that, for he studieth very much to get the goodwill and favour of the people. Yeah, he is desirous indeed. If he should gather the people together, declare unto them what Calchas has said of my daughter. Surely he might quickly persuade them to slay you and me, that they might get her the easier. But if it should chance that I should fly, then truly they would not only seek to destroy me, but also my children. Now therefore, seeing that I am in such trouble that I know not what to do, I shall desire you, O Menelaus, not to show this news unto my wife before that Iphigenia be already sacrificed, that I may be less moved with her piteous complaint. And I pray you also, O ye women, not to open this matter. Okay, so Menelaus has done a complete 180 on this and has and is now uh, telling Agamemnon not to sacrifice uh, his daughter, uh, having very vehemently argued for it before. Stephen, how does that sit with you? Waited by Agamemnon. I thought it was a brilliant speech. It was, it was fantastic, you know. Um, it, 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 it's, it's quite difficult to, to connect this bit to the previous bit, really, um, on a cold read anyway, you know. Um, this is just wonderful, I think. So uh, I was moved reading it and listening to, listening to Alan read it. I thought it was great. So I get that completely. Um, and, and we're into a completely different world of, of real politic. You know, uh, this is kind of how decisions are made and all the stuff that seems to be there early on uh, in, in the confrontation, which is you haven't behaved like a proper nobleman and, uh, you know, the host are being treated disrespectfully and you are, um, you know, the, the, you, you don't understand what honour is and so on and so forth. All of that... Um, you know, seems like some kind of Dark Ages caveman stuff. And this is sort of, you know, nice Machiavelli. Uh, yeah, well, when I said honour, well, we all know how honour works, don't we? Which is, you know, you just don't tell them this and you just manipulate that. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the contrast between the two is, is just fantastic, I think. And, and it worked brilliantly well. 
Um, but you'd have to set it up in, in the preceding chunk, I think. You know, you, you need somebody, you need, a, you need a director, really, to get you seeding all of this stuff. I think it's great. It's really easy to do. I thought, I thought it's fantastic writing. Yeah, I mean, we are we are now uh, the the culture in which the play take uh, in which the play takes place uh, is is a shame a, a, a culture where shame is a motivator. That um, having uh, Menelaus earlier makes the point that having set forth with the host, uh, it would be shameful to go back again without making war. Uh, and that Agamemnon would face the consequences of that shame when he goes home, and yet having been having been let off, so having been let off the hook by Menelaus, who's now saying, "Don't sacrifice this girl, um, don't go to, even if it means sacrificing the war instead, don't sacrifice your daughter. You shouldn't do that." Then Agamemnon says uh, that he feels he's compelled uh, to sacrifice her, um, and uh, and Alan, how do, how do you feel that? I must admit, I. And less inclined to believe Menelaus has done a reverse ferret. I think he's actually pulling um, by trying to play devil's advocate almost. He's almost boxing Agamemnon into a corner. But that just may be my paranoia. You could do a great production on that basis. Yeah. I think. Mm. It's, it's true. And for the first time in the play, we've got other characters being mentioned. Uh, uh, Ulysses, for example. Uh, um, but uh, that was just an observation. Lynn, what, what, what's your... Uh... Oh, I, I just wanted to clarify with Alan. that So you're saying Menelaus is only pretending to change his mind, knowing that if, if a Janai is going to get sacrificed anyway. So he can kind of save face as the good, caring kinsman by saying... Oh, I don't want this to happen, but in his heart he knows that it's inevitable. Is that, is that? That that's the way I was. I I was understanding it. Yeah, you could play that, but boy, that makes Menelaus yeah, Machiavellian would be putting it mildly. Oh no, Machiavelli was an amateur compared with the uh, the Greek leaders. There you go. Yeah. Any more thoughts from the room before we carry on? Uh, Francis. Yeah, I was wondering how old Iphigenia is because, of course, the younger she is, the more pitiful she is as a sort of sacrificial lamb, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 at the beginning of the play, I just assumed Iphigenia was a young woman of about, you know, 18 to 23 or something. But um, of course, at the time this is writing, she could have been like 13 or something. Yeah, so that's... I'm just wondering how old she is. We, we think that Lady Lumley herself was married somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15, uh, if that helps uh, right. at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, I have also heard that um, uh, in, the, in the period in which the the Greek play was written. It was it was quite normative for a young woman of a upper class of the aristocracy to be married when she was thirteen, fourteen. Mm. Yes, yeah. although consummation would not necessarily take place. Uh, Lois, well, Agamemnon does refer to her as the little girl, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Yeah, that's why I that's that's what got me thinking. Yeah, and Stephen. Uh, just to sort of dial, uh, call back to, to shame, he's, he's trying to avoid the shame of of telling his wife, isn't he? He's trying to avoid that as an encounter. Uh, well, is it shame? I mean, can you have one person shame? But it's an interesting juxtaposition. You know, the host and then the image of kind of having to literally look into the face of the person who bore the child. And Hell yeah, I think it's what well, I think it's the reproach that he's avoiding rather than the shame. That you know that that he knows that she'll be she won't be a happy bunny. <laughs> well, you know he is. This is the essence of tragedy that characters are torn between these conflicting duties, with with shame on one side and also dishonor on the on the other side. Uh, that. Um, 
Agamemnon ends this scene by essentially asking everyone to lie for him and, and asking the chorus to lie for him and Menelaus to lie for him. So, um, you know, it's, it's disgrace everywhere you look. Alexandra, quickly, and then we'll go on. I'm wondering about the level of public versus private um, conversation that is occurring, because as we don't have entrances and exits, it's not very clear that actually this whole scene might have happened or this whole section might have happened with the chorus, which is a group of people, as I understand it, oh, you women on stage. And also um, Senex, who is potentially maybe the leader of the chorus, maybe a separate individual. Um, but you, people who can have opinions and co who can influence that feeling of shame or of righteousness. Yes, absolutely. I think, I mean, I don't know what, what was in Lady Lumley's mind as she was translating. According to the conventions of Greek drama, Senex probably would have been played by the third man um, and, and would have and would have gone uh, off and be doubling, be doubling Nuncius and, and possibly also Achilles later on. Uh, but uh, we shall see in any case as we, as we go on and the chorus has something to say about that scene. Truly, we may see now that they are most happy, which being neither in too high a state nor yet oppressed with too much poverty, may quietly enjoy the company of their friends. But behold, here cometh Clytemnestra the queen and Iphigenia her daughter, being adorned with all nobles. Let us therefore meet her with much mirth, lest she should be abashed so at her coming into a strange country. This truly is a token of good luck that so many noble women meet us. Let us therefore come down from our chariot that they may bring us to Agamemnon's lodging. I pray you, mother, be not offended with me, though I do embrace my father. Oh, King Agamemnon, I am come hither to fulfill your commandment in that you sent for me. And I also, O oh father, am come, being not a little joyous, that I may see you. Neither am I sorry of your company, daughter. For of all my children, I love you best. What is the cause, father, that you seem to be so sad, seeing you say you are joyful at our coming? You know, daughter, that he which ruleth an host shall have divers occasions to be troubled. Although indeed a captain over an host shall be disquieted with sundry causes, yet I pray you set aside all such troubles and be merry with us which are therefore come unto you. I will follow your counsel, daughter, for I will rejoice as long as I may have your company. But what meaneth this, father, that you lament so? I have good cause to mourn, for after this day I shall not see you again of a great while. Well, I do not understand, O oh, father, what you mean by this. Truly, daughter, the more wittily you speak, the more you trouble me. If it be so, Father, then I will study to seem more foolish, that you may be delighted. Surely I am constrained to praise greatly your wit, for I do delight much in it. I pray you, Father, set away all other business and tarry amongst us, your children. Indeed, I am desirous so to do, although I cannot as yet have liberty. What is the matter, Father, that you tarry here so long in this haven? Truly, we are desirous to go hence, but we can have no passage. Where I pray you, where I pray you dwell those people which are called the Trojans. They are under the kingdom of Priamus. I would to God I might go with you into those parts. I will grant your request, daughter, for I am determined to take you with me. Shall I go alone or else with my mother? No, truly, you shall have neither the company of me, nor yet of your mother. Why? Will you set me in a strange house? Leave to inquire of such things, for it is not lawful that women should know them. Make haste, O oh father, to go unto Troy, that you may come quickly again from thence. So I do, daughter, but I must sacrifice first. Shall I be at the sacrifice, father? Yea, daughter. For you must be one of the chiefest. Why? Shall I dance about it? Truly, I count myself more happy because you do not understand me. 
go your way therefore and make you ready with the other virgins but let me first take my leave of you for this day shall separate you and me far asunder although this your marriage shall be very noble yet truly it doth grieve me to bestow you so far off whom with such care I have brought up And I'm muted. Although you are somewhat troubled, yet I am not of so slender a wit, but that I can easily be persuaded, seeing that both the custom and also the time doth require. But tell me, I pray you, shall not Achilles be my daughter's husband? Yes, truly. He is a meet marriage indeed, but I am desirous to know where he dwelleth. His dwelling is about the flood Aphidna. When, I pray you, shall the wedding be? Truly, very shortly, for we make hen haste to go hence. If it be so, then you have need to sacrifice that which must be done before the wedding. I will go about it, therefore, that the marriage may be done the quicklier. Where, I pray you, shall the feast be? Here, because of the host. Show me, I pray you, the place, that I may be partaker of it. I pray you, wife, obey me in this matter. What cause have you, O king, to say so? For when did I ever disobey you? I am determined to marry my daughter here. Shall I not, shall not I, being her mother, be at the wedding? No, truly, for she shall be married among the Grecians. Where then shall I tarry? It is best for you to go again to Greece. If I leave my daughter behind me, who shall then be in my stead? Truly, I will do your office. It doth become you to be amongst such a company of men. Although that it be not meet, indeed, yet the mother ought to be at the marriage of the daughter. But I think you have more need to be amongst your other daughters at Greece. Make you there ready, therefore, to go home. I will not go home yet, for you ought to do sacrifice only, but I must see all things made ready for the marriage. I have laboured in vain, for although I have used deceit and craft, yea, unto my dearest friends, yet I cannot fulfil my purpose. So, uh, now uh, we've, uh, Helen very rightly says that uh, the audience would have expected an entrance on a chariot as a sort of climax of the, of, of the play. And, and we have entering on a chariot uh, uh, some some new characters, uh, some some quite formidable ones. Uh, Al Alexandra, what are your thoughts? You are muted right now. Sorry, I'm I'm freezing up. Um, yes, I think it's in, it's an interesting. Um, it's definitely dramatically speaking an interesting change of dynamic to sort of go. I think we should do this. I think we should do this. Here comes the person we're going to do it to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the arrival of Iphigenia uh, definitely raises the stakes immensely. And um, yes, I, I find it interesting that um, in these conversations, in these two sort of conversations that happen with Iphigenia and with, and with Clytemnestra, there's a very clear um, stratification of, of power and kind of reinforcement of, um, you know, what a, what the role of a wife, of a daughter, of a... Of a leader of a family leader of a of a um, army what these things are that kind of reiterated which tells me that you wouldn't tell the audience something they already know unless you were trying to reinforce something they don't do so that's yeah that's interesting to me this idea of but women should be like this shouldn't they yes they should and yet we don't see that evidenced yeah and and Lynn, how do you how did you find Iphigenia? Um, that 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 little exchange is interesting to me because of the the dramatic irony that she's completely innocent and keeps kind of changing the subject. Oh, what about this? Why are you still hanging out here? Um, why are um what's going on here? So she's it's interesting that that she's the one that that basically changes the subject that, that brings up a new topic. Um in complete innocence because she doesn't know what's going on. Um, but yes. I think we should remember that the audience does. 
that these stories were very, very familiar to Euripides' audience and that they know, all everybody knows how this story turns out. They know that Iphigenia is in fact sacrificed to the gods, that um, years later, Agamemnon comes home riding a chariot with his concubine Cassandra and both of them are murdered by Clytemnestra. They know all of this. They can see this in the future. So that I think really colors the tone of these exchanges. The, the, there's that really intense dramatic irony that here's Clytemnestra, when have I ever not been obedient to you? Oh, honey. <laughs> right. uh, yes, and, and Rob? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I could talk about lots of things about uh, uh, p possible additions um, or changes. Uh, it seems from the translation I'm looking at, when if asks, "Shall I be at the sacrifice, Father?" Uh, that that actually isn't in the original. Uh, that's that's something that Lumley has, and and it, th that whole sequence feels very Abraham and Isaac. Um, mm. uh, all the way through, and I'm just wondering if actually there's there's a lot of tweaking here. Um, again, I'm working from some a, another translation. I'm not working from the original Greek, but it does feel like that maybe Lumley herself is, is turning more screws here than uh, than Euripides was doing originally. I I wondered because that father daughter scene is so sweet, and um, Lumley had this relationship with her own father who had given her and her sister this education that women did not always necessarily have at that time. But her father was a proper geek uh and and he had he had all his children given opportunities to become proper geeks and, and lumley absolutely did and she married another geek which is quite wonderful I, it's uh anyway francis yeah i found it an incredibly poignant scene because of the dramatic irony as as lynn says i mean iphigenia is completely oblivious to the fact that you know the angel of death is looming over her um, I also got, but I got very confused um, about uh, the, sa uh, the sacrifice and the wedding. Is the wedding going, to, is, there going um, is she going to be married first to Achilles? And Achilles is, uh, is at the, you know, he's by this river. Where, you know, where is Achilles, is, where is Achilles geographically? And so it was, uh, I got a bit confused about that. Yes, Alexandra, are you, were you, did I see a raised hand? No, that was an indication of, shh, nobody tell him um, oh, yeah. what's going to happen. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, I, from what I can gather, uh, they, what, what he's pretending is that the merit is that before the marriage ceremony, you have to do a sacrifice to the gods uh, as part of the ho holy um, ritual. So, um, so, so uh, nobody, uh, Agamemnon is keeping to himself so far what the sacrifice is in fact going to be. And uh, any any other thoughts before we carry on? Okay, uh, Helen, Helen. Yeah, I think you ought to, before we start again, you ought to point out that at this point, Agamemnon exits. Uh, yes, well, well, well pointed out. At this point, Agamemnon, who's been on continuously since the beginning of the play, no, 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 no. He had a period off with with Senex and Menelaus fighting. Briefly. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, you you are you are right about that. Uh, anyway, yes. At this point, Agamemnon does exit, and we get uh, the entrance of Achilles, um, Iphigenia's fake intended husband that he doesn't actually know about. Um, here we go. Where is Agamemnon, the captain of the Grecians? Or who of his servants will call him unto me? For I, being moved with the piteous complaints of the people, am compelled to inquire of their captains the cause. Why, they being constrained to forsake both their wives and their children, and also their country, now lie here idly, without any valiant deeds doing. As soon as I heard your voice, O Achilles, I came out hastily to meet you. What woman is this that seemeth so beautiful? I do not marvel, though you know not me whom you never saw, yet nevertheless I must needs praise your shamefastness. 
Well, who are you, I pray you, that you, being a woman, dare come among such a company of men? My name is Clytemnestra, and I am the daughter of Leda and the wife of Agamemnon. You have declared very well, in few words, what you are. And although you be a noble woman, yet it is not lawful for me to tarry here. Whither go you? I pray you let us shake hands together, for I trust this marriage shall be very fortunate unto you. It is not lawful that I should be so familiar with Agamemnon's wife. Yes, truly, you may be well enough, seeing you shall marry my daughter. I, I do not know what marriage you mean. Except you have heard some news, which, because you know to be untrue, you report as a false tale. I do not marvel, although you will not be known of this marriage, for it is the fashion of all young men to keep it secret for a, for a time. No, truly, I will not dissemble with you. For indeed, I never desired the marriage of your daughter. If it be so indeed, then I marvel as much of your sayings as you did of mine. Tell me, I pray you, Wherefore you have spoken these things, for it may happen that both of us are deceived. Think you that it is not a great shame unto me that I have told such a lie? But I will go now and know the truth of all this matter. Tell me, I pray you, ere you go hence where your husband is, for I am very desirous to speak with him. <laughs> Harry, I pray, O oh, please, for I must speak both with you and also with Clamestra. Who doth call me so hastily? It is even I, the servant of Agamemnon. If you have anything to say to us, come near and tell it quickly without any circumstance, for you need not to doubt us, for I know you have ever served diligently both me and also divers of mine ancestors. Because I have been ever faithful unto you, Therefore, now I must open unto a very secret thing. Truly, Agamemnon hath determined to slay Ephignia, his daughter, in sacrifice. Surely, I think, either you be mad to tell such an unlikely tale, or else, if it be so indeed, Agamemnon to be half out of his wit to agree to such a cruel murder. No, truly he is not mad, though indeed he hath played the madman's part. Wherefore, I pray you, hath he pretended to do such a cru so cruel a deed? Truly he is compelled to do so, for Calchas the prophesier hath answered that the Grecians cannot sail to Troy without the death of your daughter. If this be true, wherefore then did he feign that she should be married? That was because you should be the better willing to let her come. How, I pray you, do you know this? Agamemnon himself showed me of this thing, for once he did repent himself so much of the consenting to his daughter's death, that he was determined to send you another letter by me, which was contrary to the first. Why did you not deliver them to me? As I was bringing them, I happened to meet with Melanius, who with violence took them from me. Hear you this, O Achilles? Yea, truly, I hear it well, and I pity you much, for I do, e do even abhor this cruel deed of your husband. Now, therefore, seeing this thing is chanced so unfortunately unto me, I shall most earnestly desire you, O Achilles, to help me now in this misery, for the reproach shall be yours, seeing my daughter being sent for under the collar of your name shall now be slain. Besides this, if you do not help us, we can by no means avoid this mischief, for I alone, being a woman, cannot persuade Agamemnon, and if you forsake us, none shall dare take our part. Truly, it is a very troublesome thing to have children for we are even by nature compelled to be sorry for their mishaps. My mind is troubled more and more, 
for I am wonderfully moved with your piteous complaint. Wherefore, seeing you have required help at my hand, I will promise you to deliver both you and your daughter from this misery, if by any means I may withstand the cruel pretense of Agamemnon and his brother. For this matter pertaineth unto me also, because that if she being sent for in my name should be slain, then truly it would turn to no small dishonour to me. Wherefore I am compelled to help your daughter, so much as shall lie in my power. Not only for that I am moved with pity, but also because it should sound no little reproach to me, if that through my occasion your daughter should be slain. Surely you have spoken very well and like a nobleman. How therefore, I pray you, shall I give you thanks worthy your deserts? For if I should praise you too much, I fear lest you should I should move you to hatred rather than to pity. For then you would judge me to be a flatterer, which of all noble men is to be abhorred. Again, if I should give you fewer thanks than you deserve, then I may well be counted unthankful. So that now I doubt what to do. But seeing you so gently have gently have promised me your help, I will submit both me and my daughter under your rule. Wherefore, if it please you, I will send for her hither that she herself may require help at your hand. No, no, truly, I think it not meet that she should come abroad, for surely men would judge evil of her if she should come much amongst company. It is best, therefore, that you keep her at home, and as for my part, truly, I will do as much for her as shall lie in my power. But I think it best that you should prove first if you can persuade her father not to deliver her. Surely I shall not prevail with him, for he is so fearful that he dareth do nothing without the consent of the whole host. Although you think you shall not persuade him, yet it is meet that first you should show him what a grievous thing it is to be called a destroyer of his own children. And if he be nothing moved with that, then you may lawfully seek help at other folk's hands. You have spoken very well. Wherefore I will follow your counsel. But tell me, I pray you, where shall I find you that I may show you what answer he doth make me? I will tarry here until you come again. Ah, for surely, if I should go with you, you should be slandered by me. In all this matter, I will be ruled by you. Wherefore, if I obtain my suit, the thanks shall be yours and not mine. But now here comes Agamemnon. Show me, I pray you, therefore, what I should answer him if he ask for my daughter, seeing that she maketh such moan. Wow. So, uh, mm. I... Um, yeah, I'm I'm quite loving the dialogue in this in this scene. Um, uh, audiences of the time, of course, would have been familiar with Aeschylus's very formidable Clytemnestra from the uh, from uh, the Oresteia, uh, and and you know she's no less of a of a commanding figure here. Um, uh, Al Alexandra, how did you how did you feel that scene? Yes, I think it's um, it's really interesting how um, we get this fighting against the will of the gods sort of behavior um, without it being uh, presented. Agamemnon is the only one who knows that this is the demand uh, of the gods specifically. All Clytemnestra gets is he's he's decided to kill your daughter so she's uh you know from a from a i guess from the perspective of an audience at the time there would have been an added layer that that we nowadays don't necessarily kind of uh, catch as well so for us it's i think it's very um f for me just reading that it's very impactful that of course she'd try to fight for her daughter's life and of course she'd try and get everyone everyone on side um so i think as a modern audience member it's immediately um empathizable with yeah uh helen so, sorry oh. lynn we will get to you <laughs> oh no, 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 go ahead oh. no no i was gonna ask the people in the scene first okay um as far as achilles goes <sighs> I'd hate to say he seemed boneheaded, but he does. 
he is completely obsessed with uh, how this affects him and his honor. Um, and he also seems to have a complete phobia of anything female. Um, I mean, of course, we have to take in mind the rules on women of any rank at all in the Athens of of when this play was originally written, which was that they were honourable only in that they were never heard of or from. So, well, according to Pericles anyway, but I think he may have got it wrong. But the, but, but I mean, Achilles is entirely self-centered. It's his honour, his reputation, that matters to him, nothing else at all, really. Yeah. And okay. I also felt that Clytemnestra was not entirely sincere in everything she was saying. I mean, she was using Achilles rather than actually deferring to his um, opinion. Well, if one's daughter is in danger, then one would use, of course, any Absolutely. means necessary, would one not? So, Lynn, uh, your long-ago hand is answered at last. I, I was not actually raising my hand. Oh. I, I but, Lo Lois, but Lois is. Lois. Well, I just wanted to say that I, I don't think it's just Achilles. Uh, I don't think Achilles was necessarily all that self-centered. It seems to me his initial reaction when he figures out what's going on is horror and uh, that Clytemnestra is using uh, some of what you were t talking about. That is his uh, the sense of his reputation. This is all going to look like your fault or people will blame you uh, to get what she wants. It's, it's not, I don't think he's the one that first thinks of that, in fact. Mm. I would also love to know what the chorus actually said. I hope it was slightly more intelligent than what I was saying. That is, children are such a problem, gosh, <laughs> <I> mean, really. <laughs> Yes, that did seem a bit of a random sort of uh, parachuted, <laughs> parachuted in. Yeah. Um, uh, a Andrew, it was it's Senex that, uh, that that sets the cat among the pigeons here. Uh, how how do you feel that? Yeah, he suddenly jumps in, doesn't he? Because he, he suddenly arrived from nowhere. I felt, and then um, he came in and put the cat amongst the pigeons with um, Termestra and. Um, basically saying he didn't have the letter that he was supposed to give because it was taken away from him by Melanius. Um, so I keep thinking, is he telling the truth or is he just saying that to her? You don't know, do you? Um, yeah. I would, imagine he's, I would imagine he's saying the truth. So he, um, He's been set up as a character who can be trusted uh, to be truthful. Um, yeah, yeah. Helen, quickly, and then because we're a little bit behind time. Yeah, we'll yeah, on. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out that he, we, he, we had established that he had come into Agamemnon's service on Agamemnon's marriage, so his primary loyalty had always been Clytemnestra. Yes, that he, that her father had sent him uh, with her. Mm. Okay, um, we've got about twenty minutes to read the rest of the text. Uh, I've got, I've got one potential break in there, but I'll see what time that... It ca carry straight on unless you hear a bell. Uh, here here we have... Um, we uh, he Here comes Agamemnon, and oh boy. I'm glad to have met with you, O Clytemnestra. I have divers things to talk with you of. Uh, if you have anything to say to me, tell me, I pray you, for I am ready to hear. First... Call out my daughter that she may go with me to the temple of the goddess Diana, for I have prepared all things ready for the sacrifice. You have spoken well, though indeed your doings do not agree with your words. But go your ways, daughter, with your father, and take with you your brother Orestes. Why do you weep and lament so, daughter? Alas, how should I suffer this trouble, seeing that all mortal men are vexed both in the beginning, the midst, and the end of their misery? What is the cause that all you are so sorrowful? I will show you, if you will promise me to tell me one thing which I will require. Yes, truly I will grant your request, for I did think to have asked it of you. I hear say that you go about to slay your own child. What are you, 
you have spoken those things which you ought neither to say nor yet to think. Answer me, I pray you, to this question, as you promised. It's not lawful for me to answer you to those things which you ought not to know. I have not inquired of anything that doth not become me, but take you heed, rather, lest you make such an answer as you ought not. Who hath done you any injury, or who hath given you cause to say so? Ask you this question of me, as though your craft could not be perceived. Alas, I am troubled more and more, for all my secret counsel is now openly declared. Indeed, I have heard of all that which you have prepared for your daughter. Yea, and you yourself have partly confessed it in holding your peace. I am constrained to hold my peace. Because I have told you so manifestly that I cannot deny it. Hearken now, I pray you, therefore. For I must needs tell you of your fault. Do you not remember that, that you married me without the good will of all my friends, taking me away with strong hand, after that you had slain my other husband, Tantalus, which cruel deeds my brothers Castor and Pollux would have revenged, except Tinderus my father had delivered you out of that peril, so that by his means you did obtain me to be your wife, who after I was married never showed myself disobedient unto you in anything. And then I happened to have three sons at one birth and afterward one daughter. And will you now slay her, knowing no just cause why? For if any man should ask of you the cause of the death of your daughter, you would answer, for Helen's sake, which can be no lawful cause, for it is not meet that we should slay our own child for a naughty woman's sake, neither destroy those that by nature we ought to love for their cause only, which are hated of all men. Besides this, if you kill my daughter, what lamentation must I needs make when I shall go home and want the company of her, considering that she was slain by the hand of her own father? Wherefore, if you will not be moved with pity, take heed lest you compel me to speak those things that do not become a good wife. Yea, and you yourself do those things that a good man ought not but tell me now, I pray you, what good do you obtain by the death of your daughter? Do you look for a fortunate return? Truly, you cannot by this means get that, for that journey cannot end happily, which is begun with mischief. Besides this, sh surely you shall stir up the gods to anger against you, for they do even hate them that are man-quellers. Again, you cannot enjoy the company of your other children when you come home, for they will e even fear and abhor you, seeing that willingly you do destroy your daughter. And you shall not only fall into this mischief, but also you shall purchase yourself the name of a cruel tyrant. For you were chosen the captain over the Grecians to execute justice to all men, and not to do both me and also your children such an injury. For it is not meet that your children should be punished for that which pertaineth not to you. Neither ought I to lose my daughter for Helena's cause, who hath never showed herself faithful to her husband. It is meet, O Agamemnon, that you should follow your wife's counsel. For it is not lawful that a father should destroy his child. Now, O father, I, kneeling upon my knees and making most humble suit, do earnestly desire you to have pity upon me, your daughter, and not slay me so cruelly, for you know it is given to all mortal men to be desirous of life. Again, remember that I am your daughter, and how you seemed ever to love me best of all your children, in so much that you were wont ever to desire, that you might see me married to one worthy of my degree. And did I ever wish again that I might live to see you an old man, that you might have much joy both of me and also of your other children? And will you now consent to my death, forgetting both that which you were wont to say and also what pain you and my mother took in bringing me up, knowing no cause in me worthy of death? For what, I, for what have I to do with Helena? But now, Father, Seeing you are nothing moved with my lamentation, I will either call my young brother Orestes, for I know he will be sorry to see his sister slain. And again, you cannot choose, but you must needs have pity, either of him or else of me, considering what a lawful request we do desire. 
For you know that all men are desirous of life. And there is no wise man, but will choose rather to live in misery than to die. I know in what things I ought to show pity, and wherein I ought not. And I love my children as it becometh a father. For I do this not of myself, nor yet for my brother's sake, but rather by compulsion of the host. For the gods have answered that they cannot pass the sea without your death. And they are so desirous to go thither, that they care not what trouble and misery they suffer, so that they may see it. Wherefore, it lies not in my power to withstand them, for I am not able to make any resistance against them. I am therefore compelled, daughter, to deliver you to them. Alas, daughter, into what misery are both you and I driven, seeing that your own father will consent to your death. Alas, Mother, this is the last day that ever I shall see you. Oh, unhappy Troy, which hast nourished and brought up that wicked man Paris. Oh, unfortunate Venus, which did promise to give Helena to him. For you have been the cause of my destruction. Though indeed I, through my death, shall purchase the Grecians a glorious victory. Alas, mother, in what unlucky time was I born that mine own father, which has consented to my death, does now forsake me in this misery. I would to God that the Grecians had never taken in hand this journey. But methinks, mother, I see a great company of men coming hither. What are they, I pray you? Truly, yonder is Achilles. Let me then, I pray you, go hence, that I may hide my face, for I am ashamed. Cause have you to do so? Truly, because it was said I should have been his wife. Daughter, you must lay away all shame fast now, fastness now, for you may use no niceness, but rather prove by what means you may best save your life. Alas, Clytemnestra, how unhappy art thou, for truly there is great talking of thee in the whole city. Whereof, I pray you? Of your daughter, how she shall be slain. You have brought me very evil news, but tell me, I pray you, doth nobody speak against it? Yes, I myself have been in danger of my life because I took your daughter's part. Who, I pray you, dare hurt you? Truly, the whole host. Do not your own countrymen of Myrmidon help you? No, truly, for even they did also speak against me saying that I was in love with her, and therefore did prefer mine own pleasure above the commodity of my country. What answer then made you unto them? I said that I ought not to suffer her to be slain, which was reported by her own father, that she should have been my wife. You said very well indeed, for Agamemnon sent for her from Greece, feigning that is, was, for that purpose. But, Though I could not prevail against such a multitude of people, yet I will do as much as shall lie in my power for you. Alas, then you are alone, then you alone shall be compelled to strive against many. Do you not see a great company of harnessed men? I pray God they be our friends. Aye, truly, that they be. Then I hope my daughter shall not die. No, that she shall not if I can help her. But will there come anybody hither to slay her? Yea, truly, Ulysses will be here anon with a great company of men to take her away. Is he commanded to do so, or doth he it but of his own head? No, truly, he's not commanded. Alas, then he hath taken upon him a wicked deed, seeing he will defile himself with the danger and death of my daughter. Truly? but I will not suffer him. But if he go about to take my daughter away with strong power, what shall I do then? Uh, you will best keep her by you, for no, the matter shall be driven to that point. Hearken, O oh mother, I pray you unto my words, for I perceive you are angry with your husband, which you may not do, for you cannot obtain your purpose by that means. And you ought rather to have thanked Achilles because he so gently hath promised you his help, which may happen to bring him into great mischief. I would counsel you, therefore, to suffer this trouble patiently, 
for I must needs die, and will suffer it willingly. Consider, I pray you, mother, for what a lawful cause I shall be slain. Doth it doth not both the destruction of Troy and also the wealth of Greece, which is the most fruitful country of the world, hang upon my death? And if this wicked enterprise of the Trojans be not revenged, then truly the Grecians shall keep neither their children nor yet their wives in peace. And I shall not only remedy all these things with my death, but also get a glorious renown to the Grecians forever. Again, remember how I was not born for your sake only, but rather for the commodity of my country. Think you therefore that it is meet that such a company of men being gathered together to revenge the great injury which all Greece has suffered should be let of their journey for my cause. Surely, mother, we cannot speak against this, for do you not think it to be better that I should die than so many noble men to be let of their journey for one woman's sake? For one noble man is better than a thousand women. Besides this, Seeing my death is determined amongst the gods, truly no mortal man ought to withstand it. Therefore, I will offer myself willingly to death for my country. For by this, I shall not only leave a perpetual memory of my death, but I shall also, but I shall cause also the Grecians to rule over the barbarians, which doth as it were properly belong to them. For the Grecians by nature are free like as the barbarians are born to bondage. Surely you are happy, O Iphigenia, that you can suffer so patiently all this trouble. Truly, I would count myself happy if I have obtained thee, O Iphigenia, to be my wife. And I think thee, O Greece, very for to be very fortunate because thou hast nourished such a one for you have spoken very well in that you will not strive against the determination of the gods. Wherefore I, being not only moved with pity, for that I see you brought into such necessity, but also stirred up more with love towards you, desiring to have you to my wife, will promise you faithfully to withstand the Grecians as much as shall lie in my power, that they shall not slay you. Surely I have spoken as I thought indeed, wherefore I shall desire you, O Achilles, not to put yourself in danger for my cause, but suffer me rather to save all Greece with my death. Truly, I wonder greatly at the boldness of your mind. And because you seem to be so willing to die, I cannot speak against you. Yet, Nevertheless, I will promise to help you still, lest you should happen to change your mind. Wherefore, mother, do you hold your peace, lamenting so within yourself? As I, wretched creature, have great cause to mourn. Be of good comfort, mother, I pray you, and follow my counsel, and do not tear your clothes so. How can I do otherwise, seeing I shall lose you? I pray you, mother, study not to save my life, for I shall get you much honor by my death. What shall not I lament your death? No, truly, you ought not, seeing that I shall both be sacrificed to the goddess Diana and also save Greece. Well, I will follow your counsel, daughter, seeing you have spoke so well. But tell me, what shall I say to your sisters from you? Desire them, I pray you, not to mourn my death. And what shall I say unto the other virgins from you? Bid them all farewell in my name, and pray you, for my sake, bring up my little brother Orestes till he comes to a man's age. Take your leave of him, for this is the last day that ever you shall see him. Farewell, my well-beloved brother, for I am even, as it were, compelled to love you because you were so glad to help me. Is there any other thing that I may do for you at Greece? No, truly. But I pray you, do not hate my father for this deed, for he is compelled to do it. 
for the wealth and honour of Greece. If he hath done this willingly, then truly he hath committed a deed far unworthy of such a noble man as he is. Who is this that will carry me hence so soon? I will go with you, O oh daughter. Take heed, I pray you, lest you happen to do that which shall not become you. Wherefore, on whether, I pray you follow my counsel and tarry here still, for I must needs go to be sacrificed unto the goddess Diana. And will you go away, O oh daughter, leaving me, your mother, here? Yea, surely, mother, I must go from you unto such a place from whence I shall never come again, although I have not deserved it. I pray you, daughter, tarry, and do not forsake me now. Surely I will go hence, mother, for if I did tarry, I should move you to more lamentation. Wherefore, I shall desire all you women to sing some song of my death, and to prophesy good luck unto the Grecians, for with my death I shall purchase them a glorious victory. Bring me therefore unto the altar of the temple of the goddess Diana, that with my blood I may pa pacify the wrath of the gods against you. O oh, Queen Clytemnestra of most honor, after what fashion shall we lament, seeing we may not show any token of sadness at the sacrifice? I would not have you mourn for my death, for I, will not, for I will not refuse to die. Indeed, by this means you shall get yourself a perpetual renown forever. Alas, thou sun, which art the comfort to man's life, O thou light, which dost make joyful all creatures, I shall be compelled by and by to forsake you and to change my life. Behold, yonder goeth the virgin to be sacrificed, with a great company of soldiers after her, whose beautiful face and fair body anon shall be defiled with her own blood. Yet happy art thou, O Iphigenia, that with thy death thou shalt purchase unto the Grecians a quiet passage, which I pray God may not only happen fortunately unto them, but also that they may return again prosperously with a glorious victory. Come hither, O Clytemnestra, for I must speak with you. Tell me, I pray you, what you would with me that you call so hastily. Is there ever any more mischief in hand that I must hear of? I must tell you of a wonder which hath happened at the sacrificing of your daughter. Show me, I pray you, quickly what it is. As we went unto the palace where the sacrifice should be, and passed through the present fields, where the whole host waited for your daughter, Agamemnon, seeing her brought unto her death, began to lament and weep. But she, perceiving what moan her father made, said unto him these words, O father, I am come hither to offer my body willingly for the wealth of my country. Wherefore, seeing that I shall be sacrificed for the commodity of all Greece, I do desire you that none of the Grecians may slay me privily, for I will make no resistance against you. And when she had spoken these words, all they which were present were wonderfully astonished at the stoutness of her mind. <clears throat> so after this, Achilles with the rest of the whole host began to desire the goddess Diana, that she would accept the sacrifice of the virgin's blood and that she would grant them a prosperous success of their journey. And when they had made an end, the priest, taking the sword in his hand, began to look for a place convenient where he might slay your daughter. Suddenly there chanced a great wonder, for, all, for although all the people heard the voice of the stroke, yet she vanished suddenly away. And when, when all they, marvelling at it, began to give a great screech, then there appeared unto them a white heart, lying before the altar, struggling for life. And Calchas, being then present, and seeing what had happened, did wonderfully rejoice, and told the captains that this heart was sent of the goddess, because she would not have her altar defiled with the blood of your daughter. Moreover, he said that this was a token of good luck, and that their journey should chance prosper prosperously unto them. Wherefore he willed that they should tarry no longer here. 
And when this was so finished, Agamemnon willed me to show all these things unto you, because that I myself was present then. Wherefore, I shall desire you to think no unkindness in the king, your husband, for surely the secret power of the gods will save them whom they love. For this day your daughter hath been both alive and dead. Surely, O Clytemnestra, you ought to rejoice at this news, that your daughter is taken up into heaven. But I am in doubt whether I should believe that thou, O daughter, art among the gods, or else that they have feigned it to comfort me. Uh, behold, yonder cometh Agamemnon, who can tell the truth of all this matter. Truly, wife, we are happy for our daughter's sake, for surely she is placed in heaven. But now I think it best that you go home, seeing that we shall take our journey so shortly unto Troy. Wherefore now fare you well, and of this matter I will commune more at my return, and in the mean season, I pray God, send you well to do and your heart's desire. O oh, happy Agamemnon, the gods grant thee a fortunate journey unto Troy, and a most prosperous return again. And here ends the play. Mm. Uh, we of the Greek audience, of course, would know what would happen on Agamemnon's return from yes. Troy. Uh, and uh, it's worth noting that some people have doubted whether the messenger's speech is Euripides or an addition, but, but Euripides does write a sequel play of what happens to Iphigenia after her disappearance from here, uh, Iphigenia and Taurus. Um, so, oh my gosh, thoughts from the room. <laughs> Uh, that is Lynn. Yeah, my understanding is that there are, as with with all myths, competing variants uh, of what happened at uh, at Aulis when uh, Iphigenia was was sacrificed. So, you know, one version of the story said she was whisked away to to marry somebody. I, I actually have not read if Iphigenia at Taurus, um, but other, there are variants of the myth that said yes, she was indeed killed, but. Um, the difference between those two outcomes is maybe not as extreme as one might think. I think one of the things that the that this myth rehearses, that this myth echoes, is that um, when a young girl was married, um, she left home. Uh, so the marriage was not, the society was not only patrilineal, it was patrilocal. A, a woman went to live with her husband's family. And because aristocratic women were expected to stay at home as much as possible, a, a woman might genuinely never see her daughter again once her daughter was married. So that parallel between getting married and between marriage and death for a young woman, as far as her family was concerned, was actually was actually very present, I think, in in the original audience's minds that She's gone as far as Clytemnestra is concerned. Whether she's dead or not, she'll never see her daughter again. Mm. Uh, Alex? On the, on the subject of, of historical Greek differences to our own existence, um, the, I, I really enjoyed the way in which Achilles says, um, uh, I people will people will think I'm in love with her with the girl I'm about to marry, you know, and they'll think less of me because I actually like the girl. And then um, slightly later on, when uh, when uh, he decides to uh, kind of fight for her, fight on her behalf, um, that is the argument he brings. Do you know what? I actually quite like you now. Um, and uh, and sorry, Lynn, you're you're muted. Oh, I thought you were commenting. Um, yes, and so th this this thing that is kind of alien to us as a concept, but that you know those marriages would have been arranged, and and that it was less honourable to be attached to your wife. Um, it was less manly to be to 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 be attached to your wife in that kind of sentimental way. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Um... It's uh, classical Greece was both a familiar and an unfamiliar place to to us, 
so um, I think uh, it may be time to go around the room for final thoughts. And I'm going to start with Alan. Uh, Alan, what are your final thoughts? It's an interesting piece. Um, you know, I think, as we said, the, the fact that we get these great slabs of text at certain points is something that we've not been used to with the readings we've been doing over the last number of months. Um, and they do slow the whole thing down, although they get a heck of a lot of data across in a very short order. Um, I must admit, the scenes where there is the quick fire back and forth work better for me because I can actually understand that in the context of maybe more modern drama. Um, but it, it certainly works. And I think one thing that would be interesting would be to actually look at what was excised in the translation. We know that substantial chunks of the chorus were taken out. And I just wonder whether the, the restoration of odd lines of that might actually help with the flow or the exposition. And also um, marking entrances and exits a bit more clearly because that was it was not always clear to me whether I was actually in presence or not. Yeah, I think the absence of the chorus does uh, do, does uh, leave us guessing as to where scene breaks occur. On that note, Lois, final thoughts? Yeah, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, I've seen a number of productions of Greek tragedies in English, and I've always been rather bored. Well, not always, but often rather bored by the chorus. And uh, it was quite interesting. You could really cut the chorus entirely, I think, from this play, in fact. Uh, yeah, I was... Um, I mean, it seems to me a lot of what they say, if any of you know A. Houseman's parody of a Greek tragedy, he's got the chorus saying, and oh, my son, be on the one hand good, and do not, on the other hand, be bad, for that is very much the safest plan. You know, that's the kind of stuff they, they come out with. And uh, uh, I was quite pleased not to have a, a lot of this sort of thing. Um, you know, I think it's an extremely effective play, actually. I mean, it's it's got, you know, the things we noted, the, the quarrel and making up, and then the, all the dramatic irony. Uh, and the effect also actually of that child on the stage, Orestes, who is obviously quite important in the production, although we didn't have any real sense of him as we were reading it. Yeah, I mean, Euripides uses child supernumeraries in a couple of his other plays, Trojan Women, uh, uh, and, and those child supernumeraries don't speak, they're just talked about. Uh, anyway, Lynn, final thoughts? Oh, um, I don't. I don't really have much to to add. Um, I think you know the as I said before, what makes this work, what makes this, what really underlies the effects of this text is the audience's familiarity of how the story ends. Um, in uh, in Agamemnon's <clears throat> in Agamemnon's death, and then or revenge and a murder of of his mother, and. And so this is an in, this is this is interesting to them because this is where it all starts, is that this is the sort of a, a turning point in this cycle of of death. Although the the house of Atreus cycle of which this is a part, um, yeah, keeps uh, child murder and and incest and cannibalism and stuff you know recur over and over again in the in the larger cycle. But this is one of those pivot moments in that in that larger cycle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the act of destruction that sets the whole thing going. That none of, uh, until the end of the play, nobody's a murderer yet. Uh, uh, so, um, Helen, what are your final thoughts? Well, it didn't feel very Euripides to me. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, obviously, I, I'm of the generation which was brought up entirely on Gilbert Murray, as far as. Greek plays are concerned, and it 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 didn't feel right somehow. Um, I I'm now going to have to go back to other English translations and see um, see what why I'm thinking this. Um, but it's not tremendously playable 
if I was writing it, I wouldn't have all Achilles' lines start truly. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think it was proper. I mean, it may have been intended to be played within the household, but certainly never ever got anywhere near even being thought of for a commercial stage. I mean, it's not that sort of play. It's more an academic exercise. Um, I mean, I know Aeschylus better than Euripides, but it's still, um, it's a bloody business, whatever happens. Yeah, it, ex extremely bloody, in fact. Um, lots of blood. Uh, Francis, final thoughts? Oh, uh, sorry, I was just um, distracted by something in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Hold on. <laughs> Um, yeah, God, so much to say. I found it a very gripping play. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this session. I totally disagree with Helen. Um, I think I think it's very playable. Uh, I think there are lots of challenges for an actor in this in this um, in this piece, and for a director. Um, I would love to see a production of it, or be in a production of it, or, and I'd be very interested to know if there have been any recent productions of this piece. Um, I I also agree with um, Lois uh, that I, I mean I find, I often find the chorus in uh, in Greek plays really boring and dull, um, and I think you could totally cut the chorus out of um, out of this one. I mean, the chorus's lines in this seem totally irrelevant to the to the ongoing action at uh, most uh, most points. Um, and I suspect that uh, Lady Lumley got rid of a lot of the um, you know, classical references um, that you typically find in, uh, you know, in these endless chorus speeches um, sometimes. Um, what else? Oh, and I was also waiting, I, I was waiting for that um, Greek convention right at the end, you know, right at the climax where the mass messenger comes running on and, and has this long speech and tells you all the dramatic events that have happened off stage. And sure enough, we got it. And I got, and I got to actually say it. So um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that. Oh, excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, wait, um, Stephen, final thoughts. I'm trying, I'm trying to sort my final thoughts. Um, I sort of, I don't know, I'm trying to, trying to understand why I got so irritated with Iphigenia at the end. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit like um, that there's just so much dramatic irony that, you know, I kind of imagine at some point Dickens going, okay, enough, you know, just, will you just sort of back off with it, really? Um, and uh, at, at what point, I mean, this happened to me, so it's, I hit a point where I just went, will you just stop being so, like that about this? You know, we, we just do not agree with you so much, <laughs> you know, uh, and I, uh, it reminded me a little bit of, um, of for, the, for the elders uh, back in the day when, uh, you know, slasher movies were in. There was this kind of theory. One of the, one of the things about slasher movies is that people go to them, you know, like for example, women enjoy them not because they identify with the victims, but they identify with the slasher who's kind of getting rid of some annoying idiot who says, "Let's all split up." There's a bloke with an axe, you know. <laughs> the best thing to do is, you know, it's a little bit like that. Um, and I wonder if uh, the reason why we've basically got the last sort of few lines of what might have been her big soliloquy detached uh, and instead uh, instead of them being tacked onto the end where it would just be you know and here are my last words for you and here's my last words for you they it sets up a scene with a mother basically feeding saying what should i say to this person what should i say to this person and what should i say to them you could imagine an alternative to that would be uh, sticking it into into the monologue you know at which point she would that that sort of would just topple completely that sort of level of self-possession and sort of stepford like buy-in to the values that everybody is screaming are completely sort of 
you know, laid waste by by the play. So so that's it. it's just incoherent. And I was thinking, but behind that is that question of dramatic irony, and how it inflects how we respond to things, so that we respond to them in a different way to if we were just seeing them in real life. Yeah. Yeah, interest, interesting questions there. Uh, Andrew, final thoughts? Uh, you are muted, I am afraid. Um, I agree with Alan. I like the dramatic parts with the um, dialogue that went to and fro. I did enjoy the, um, the large chunks. I think it was just getting to grips with what was actually happening within the Greek tragedy. I've seen some Greek tragedies before many years ago and I do remember the chorus being um, a major part of the production um, and they seem to have cut that completely from this production um, and I agree with Lois I think that it doesn't really need a chorus at all um, the the, um, the play runs well um, and is very playable for actors there's lots of um, interesting parts that can be um, put forward as a piece. Um, I, th I think maybe some of it may need reworking um, to be um, a piece to stand up on its own, but I really enjoyed uh, all the different uh, parts of it and the way it, it dissolved into the um, ending of the tragedy of uh, the... Um... Yeah, yeah. Um... yeah. Sorry, my, my signal went then. Oh, yeah. Ephigenia, um, with um, the, the tragedy of her. And um, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Alex, final thoughts? Um, so I like it. Um, and I like it because it doesn't get properly resolved um, in a satisfying way because I that's what I like um, out of Greek tragedies that's what I feel uh, makes them good makes the ones that I enjoy good is that they present a problem that can't be solved one way or the other um, so you've got people arguing for one solution people arguing for the other solution wonderfully people switching sides um, but uh, there is no one way of, of fixing the thing and either way there will have to be some kind of sacrifice um, so it's kind of it's a little bit too tidy at the end for me with this version of events occurring um, but um, but I think one of the one of the purposes of or not purposes, one of the great uses of these things um, in the original context would have been posing that problem to the audience, going, this is unsolvable, you should really think about it, without going, hey, audience, stop to think about this, and hey, audience, here is the lesson you should take. Um, and I feel like a, a large part of that is what, what the chorus does by being, you know, the voice of, mm, I consider this and mm, I consider this also, which makes them seem very kind of, um, um, I don't know what the word is for, for someone who kind of shifts from one opinion to the other. Ambivalent. Um, but I, ambivalent. It makes them very like that, but on purpose, because that allows the audience to do the same. Um, so I wonder what has been cut you know, not not being able to go from memory and go, oh yes, Euripides had that bit there and um, we don't. Um, I wonder about those things and also about what else um, Lady Lumley might have restructured in order to achieve some things that she intended to achieve rather than, you know, what, what perhaps the play was. In terms of doing that for a modern performance, therefore, I think there's a choice between do we want to just do what she uh, sort of cut it down to and, and translate it and aim for whatever that is or do you want to go back to the text do some more recutting restructuring break some of the big speeches up join up some of the shorter lines etc um, how would we what would be the conflict that we'd want our modern audience to internalize um, and how would we go about doing that those are my questions at the end of that. Really good questions. I mean, Lumley seems to have focused very much on the family drama um, 
the, there there are some barnstorming speeches in there, and and I I very much love them. I I think that um, to have the chorus, as it were, contemplating uh, the action. Um, in between scenes, uh, as Helen noted, covering scene ch changes and costume changes between the actors, but uh, to have the chorus reflect on what's just happened uh, is very much like what we do in these chats, so perhaps the absence of the choral odes is compensated for by the presence of, um, of geeks like us going, hmm, what has just happened? Uh, and on that note, Rob, final thoughts, and I'll hand back to you for cl for closing. Yes, thank you very much, Liza. Um, uh, wonderful job uh, c covering for me today. Uh, it's been a horrible mind confusion thing trying to read a completely different translation of this play. Uh, I think it, Helen talking about how it didn't feel uh, like Euripides, I, it, it seems that a lot of the really emphatic theatrical cursing has been toned down and there's a lot of action that has been slightly shifted uh, it's in prose rather than in verse which means that there's a certain amount of bloat to the longer speeches because rather than going for a very concise thing it's allowing itself to stretch out and over explain plot details um, she cuts away a lot of extraneous gods there's a lot of extraneous god action uh, sometimes in dialogue, sometimes the dialogue has been trimmed back. Sometimes lines of dialogue have been elided or slightly shifted. This, this, you could spend ages going over what what has actually shifted and changed. Um, it it really was fascinating. Um, I would say sort of the emphasis here is rather than theatre with uh, with action, it's drama. It's been turned into drama without dramaturgy. There's no interest in how people get on and off stage or how time jumps occur, because that's what choruses are for. Um, it's really just interested in the drama of the scenes, the drama of people talking to each other or speechifying at each other. Um, and I say, interesting just shaving off on the edges. So Clytemnestra, uh, do you not remember that you married me without the goodwill of all my friends? Which uh, in the original is uh, uh, more along the lines of, do you not remember how you married me against my will? And that's quite a, a different thing. Um, so, uh, and another uh, line where it's, you know, I would to God it had not happened, which was more uh, in the original along the lines of I curse for this thing happening. Um, so there's, there's a certain pulling back on that. But then there's just so many interesting changes that seem to be deliberate, not just about cutting it down. I'm just going, just not interested in... Because uh, in terms of clarity of action, I don't think the choruses help clarity of action necessarily. A lot of the, the, the choral odes do not necessarily explain anything. Um, they may reiterate. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking at this as, as probably a continuation of our audio series. Uh, we've been almost released uh, other, uh, the other uh, major uh, plays by uh, women writers from the period so we've almost got out on the podcast the tragedy of Mariam we've almost got out uh, uh, the tragedy of Antony one of which is a translation one is which is an original text and I see very much this is the next project in line with that as uh, as an audio production I think you can bridge those problems of the chorus with a bit of music um, I, I think it's interesting yeah that question of is the chorus necessary and where some of the lines don't work as well do seem to be the choruses lines. They're the ones where I don't feel they really fit in the way that some of the others do. The, the, some some bits are, are fant I think are much better in this. Some some are not. There's a sort of give and take uh, about how the translation and the adaptation. And the more I was going through it, it feels more adapty than it feels translatey. Mm. Uh, at times, um, yeah. and and I I I think there's a there's a lot of good here. There's a lot of good here, and maybe just micro trims, is how I'm I'm thinking about it dramaturgically. Uh, but we have seriously run out of time. Uh, uh, we had a lot of text to get through today. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, to Liza for um, hosting the session today. And also thank you very much to all the readers today. Uh, I say more av material on uh, uh, early modern uh, women writing is available on the podcast with more material to come. And it is something we are going to be continuing looking at into next year and beyond. Thanks to all the readers and goodbye. Bye. Bye.